So I guess what I'm going to talk about is actually not quite what Simon uh, boasted of last evening, but rather almost the opposite, not of how you can get things into Python, but in fact about how hard it is to get things into Python because, well, I mean, I put in the title that in fact Guido and the core developers did so much right already that things that seem right that are changed are not. Um, I also wanted to say I, I'm going to show a bunch of slides that have some code on them, and the code's probably about the size of the top header, so if you can't read the top header, either put on glasses or move closer. Um, oh, here's a bit about who I am, which I don't need to go through, but I'm a director of the Python Software Foundation, and I'm, as it say, I'm on a couple of the committees, and I write books and articles about Python, and I work for a lab that has done um, a big supercomputer for doing molecular dynamics. But here's the topic. I read, and probably some of you in the room do as well, a mailing list called Python Ideas, which is sort of the precursor in a way to the Python dev mailing list where things actually get implemented for the Python language. And lots of things are kicked around there, but the general idea is that um, you know, anyone who wants to join the list can bring up ideas for things they would like changed in the Python language, perhaps in the you know, support libraries or uh, a variety of things, and it's actually a really um, fascinating and erudite discussion. Um, I'm not sure everybody should necessarily subscribe. I mean, there's quite enough volume already, but most things that happen even before they get to a PEP probably run through here. Um, oh, did I say enough here? Oh, yeah, well, I do mention here that I'm not a core developer, so I follow this, but that's sort of all I know. Um, so. This is the topic I'm going to talk about in a way that something that came up about a year ago on the discussion list. And um, what I wonder is what are people's intuition about what this little bit of code is going to do? Is it obvious to people? Do you have any opinions? Shout out. I'm <laughs> Well, you've, you've probably looked at the slides already. <laughs> I, 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 would have, I would have been wrong as well until I ran the code. Of course, what you see is an error, but this is a trick question. I mean, what we really mean here is code just slightly different. That's, um, we need an initializer. We need to start with an empty list, and then we can um, concatenate a series of lists that get added in to the initial list. It's not obvious, and the second argument is kind of weird to be there, but it does technically work. Um, and the reason it works is because what this built-in sum function does is essentially the same, I mean, it's written in C, but it's essentially the same as this little bit of Python code you see there where you get this um, start object, this um, variable, that is simply the aggregation of results in repeated addition. Um, and so, you know, it's just sort of a generalization of what I have at bottom, where we've used the plus sign between two lists, and we do that a bunch of times. And so, you know, if you know that, you know that it's going to produce this big list. Um, but let's look a little deeper. What is, we see the plus sign, and it has a sort of intuitive meaning from mathematics and so on although it really isn't for mathematics because in math we don't concatenate lists and call that plus. But what we're doing is we're actually calling this special method, this dunder add method on whatever the initializer is, and since we happen to use the plus symbol when we want to concatenate lists, as we do when we want to add two numbers together, then calling that same magic method dunder add on lists you know, does something and you do it a bunch of times and it produces a result just as if you were adding a bunch of numbers. Almost as if. Um, so here's another question. Um, here's a little bit of code. What are people's, and I don't know, no one really has a laptop out, but what is your intuition about what this little bit of code would do? Um, Well, 
well, yeah, three million element list. The problem is that if you had your laptop out and you had started it, it wouldn't finish running before the conference was over. We're on the second day, so it's not really that much of a challenge, but it would take about three days actually to finish on my fairly fast laptop. So that's sort of not ideal. Um, and, and here's a bunch more detail, and I'm not gonna quite go through everything on the slide, but I've timed a bunch of things, and I've tried this sum operation across lists of lists of lists of various sizes, uh, 2,000 and, um, what is it, 5,000 and, or 10,000 and 50,000 elements. So I've just increased by five the time times the size of the list of lists. Um, and we see the performance is essentially big O, or big theta actually, of n squared, which is terrible performance, and that's why we can't do this with this um, million element list of lists. Um, and I, I think I, I kind of get into it in the slides, but the reason this is bad is if you think back to the previous slide, we're doing this addition operation, but we're, we need to create a new list on the left-hand side and assign that to a new object, which just happens to have the same name start. So we do that over and over, but we keep destroying the old list and creating a new list, and this is a whole lot of operations on allocating and deallocating memory and um, wiping things out, and it is n squared. Now, one intuition you might have is that tough luck, this is a tough operation. And in fact, there is, it's an n squared operation, and it's going to be difficult. But that's not true. There's actually an easy way to do it. We can use this, I mean, there's other ways as well, but we can use iter tools chain, which simply takes elements lazily and constructs the list just from the elements that are put into it um, from an iterator. And here we get a tenth of a second time, so it's quite fast. And this is what we'd, how we'd like it to perform. This is not actually a very difficult operation to create a you know, list of three million things. So, oh, this is a, I, I gave a similar version of this talk um, last year at, in the UK. And somebody in the audience pointed out in questions that, to be picky, I didn't really need to create the actual instantiated list in my example of a million elements, and we could do that lazily as well, and we so would save a tiny bit of time. But in real life, if you're doing this, you probably aren't just um, taking a bunch of lists that are all the same, one, two, three, but rather, a, you know, your million different elements uh, that are each lists of various things inside them. Um, so that slide's not important. Um, so, so this slowness, this uh, bad uh, n-squared behavior was subject of a proposal, an idea on Python ideas. And what this guy Sergey proposed is that we should just change the implementation of sum that goes into the Python core language, and we should make it just a little teeny bit different. What we should do is we should use the inline add operator rather than the add operator. And it turns out that lists know when they get this plus equals, which is equivalent to the magic dunder i add method, that they don't need to destroy and reallocate objects. They can simply take the object and do this um, amortized expansion of the size as needed. But, but basically, it, it's not much allocation. It's, um, I guess it's log n frequency that they actually have to allocate because there's a pre-allocated block. But in any case, there's not nearly as much uh, destruction of an allocation of memory, so it's, it's fast. And in particular, we can see how fast in the next slide, I think. Um, yeah, okay, so we do it here with the reasonable size 50,000, and we do it also with the million elements, and we see that, in fact, it's even faster than that iter tools method that we saw by little bit, but same sort of order of magnitude, that we get things in some tens of milliseconds even for very large or large-ish lists. So, so this is cool, right? I mean, we go faster, there's this, you know, I mean one line, but really it's, you know, a few characters change in the implementation, and it's much faster. Um, this pure Python implementation is a little bit slower when you're just adding numbers like you'd normally do with some, 
But if we were to do the same thing in C, it would probably be the, exactly the same speed for adding numbers as the current implementation. So, you know, I mean, the Python's just to show the concept, but were we to do this, we could uh, do it in C and it would be fast. So, this is the proposal that came up on Python Ideas, and it was, you know, discussed a, a year ago with hundreds and hundreds of posts in the thread, and it sort of recurred recently, just a few weeks before this conference with some uh, similar ideas, but just getting rehashed. Um, so, it, and it'll probably come up again. I mean, it'll probably be a question that, you know, people who didn't see the previous thread or weren't convinced by it raise for as long as we have Python. Um, so it's such a good idea, and I oppose it vehemently, and most of the members of the Python Ideas list oppose it vehemently, um, which is odd, so I need to tell you reasons for that. The first reason in my mind, and I think this is really tantamount, is I don't think that this behavior of using sum to concatenate a bunch of sequences is obvious. It's probably obvious enough to the people in this room because we're experienced Python programmers and we kind of know that, well, what is the plus sign? The plus sign is really a call to a method behind the scenes and that same method is implemented on objects of various types, whether they're numeric types or whether they're sequence types or you know, various custom types. And, and so we sort of know at least enough of the internals that it makes sense that it does what it does. But I, I don't think it's obvious to beginners. And I don't think it's, I mean, and beginners could be people who are just learning to program, whether we you know, have uh, Python in school curricula or whether it's people who come from other programming languages. Um, and I mean, moreover, it's, we happen to use the plus sign for both adding numbers together and for concatenation, but that's not inevitable. I mean, Perl uses a dot for string concatenation, for example. Um, and other languages use other things for what we think of as sort of adding informally different types of objects. Um, so it's kind of a coincidence that it's the plus operator. Not that I'm, I want to change that, but it's, but it's not sort of essential. But what I did is I, I sort of wanted to do a, you know, very informal, uh, you know, social psychology of this or something. And I asked a couple people who were not experienced programmers, and one was a beginner program, beginning programmer, and one was just not a programmer at all, but you know, I talked to enough that um, she has to put up with me talking about programming. Um, and you know, what do they think it should do? So, so, so I devised this little example where we show them this code, and this is sort of, you know, I mean, you can imagine a non-programmer or a child or a, someone in a different language and asking them what this does. Well, of course, what it does is it breaks because we saw that on the second slide or something, but, but don't just sort of ignore that part because that's sort of incidental. Um, but one of the people, the sort of semi-programmer I talked to, thought that this should raise an error. This should be an exception. And not because it should be an exception because of this odd case of not having the start variable as an initializer, but just because it doesn't make sense to do. And in fact, if you try the same sort of thing to sum a bunch of strings, which you might think is, well, okay, that's fine, we're concatenating a bunch of strings, it actually will raise an exception because the, um, I'm, trying to write, I'm not sure if it was Raymond Hedinger or somebody else who put it into the language, but whoever actually put sum into the language in the first place after a bunch of discussion on Python dev or somewhere, thought, you know, this is a really bad idea and, and it's gonna have this same bad uh, performance if we try to let people concatenate strings with uh, the sum, and so therefore we're just gonna look for that case right off the bat and throw an exception um, just, just exactly as my novice programmer thinks because it doesn't make sense to do, or at least it's a very bad idea to do. Um, but so here, here's an intuition, and I, and I think this is interesting um, if you think about teaching your know, students. Uh, this is an intuition that a non-programmer had about what this little bit of code would do, and their intuition was essentially, 
you know, element-wise operation, uh, mapping some over each of the things in this list, uh, which, you know, I mean, we have obviously these kind of element-wise operations in NumPy, and we have it in languages like Mathematica and R and things like that. And, and it's interesting that that is actually a possible intuitive behavior here. Um, you know, as you can see, 4 plus 5 plus 2 is 11, and, and so on for the other ones. But here's another obvious answer, I mean, at least obvious to someone, is that actually what some should do if you give it a bunch of lists of lists of numbers is that, well, maybe it'll go through and it'll just find all the numbers and add them together because, you know, sum is something that applies to numbers and so we should go find all the numbers and add them together, which seems like a perfectly reasonable answer as well. Um, but there's a, it doesn't, the fact that there's this multiplicity of obvious answers doesn't quite match our rule from the Zen of Python that there should be one and only one obvious way to do something because this has various obvious answers. Um, but here's another problem. I, I actually think the intuition one is the most important, but it's not, even if we were to make that change that was proposed on an earlier slide where we use the inline add rather than the add, it, it can make adding lists fast, but it doesn't make everything fast. So for example, if we try to do the same thing with tuples and we use um, this, uh, you know, we import this same Python code that I showed you on the previous slide, which um, is just in this module sum. Oh, and by the way, the slides and the little code samples are all in that URL if you want to find them later. Um, anyway, the, the point is tuples can't have a fast inlined add, or at least they don't, because a tuple is immutable. You don't have it pre-allocated to a different size. So, in fact, you have to destroy the tuple and create a new one every time, even if you use the inline operation. So, we could make this change and then it becomes an attractive nuisance. We think, you know, we made this change, people might be lured into thinking it's going to be fast for concatenating sequences and, you know, maybe they're right, maybe they're not right, but it's sort of more subtle about when that's going to be true and when it's not going to be true. Um, Well, so in this long discussion thread, there, was, there were ideas about how we could make tuple fast too. We could sort of mark tuples as sort of fixed size, but nonetheless pre-allocated. And you, we, we could customize this particular ob object tuple so that it, you know, could be summed fast. Um, but that's still just, you know, so then maybe it would work for list and it would work for tuple, but it wouldn't work for all the other sequence types that might exist in the world. There might be some that are, you know, stuck in the collections module, not, not really so much right now, but there could be in the future. Um, well, maybe for set now, I don't know. But, um, but also there's many, many third party, party uh, sequence types objects in the world. And, and I mentioned here in particular, I don't know how useful this is for Python, but in Lisp and Scheme and those type of languages, sequences are generally done as singly list lists or sing singly linked lists or con cells. And there's no way you could modify the in place add on this cons type list to make it fast because you'd have to always march through the list to get to the last element. Which isn't to say there couldn't be a different kind of sum function that knew specifically about cons lists and maintained a pointer to where you had left off. And I, I, there's, there's ways you could make that one sequence type sum faster with your custom sum function, but it's case by case. And you can't do it by making that global change. You have to do all kinds of type checking. Um, but, it, but here's another point that I think is subtle, and this is uh, possibly the point that was most important to Guido and the people who actually decided to reject it, is there are different semantics and it actually isn't backward compatible to make this change that was proposed. So we look at these lines of code, we look at, uh, you know, sequence equals sequence plus other sequence versus inline add, and they look kind of the same. They look like they, you know, we often think of the second one as 
a shorthand way of expressing the first, and I mean, I you know, often kind of do a very slight refactoring of my code to just use the shorter form, and it's nice looking. Uh, and, but then let's think a little deeper. Internally, what they're doing is they're calling different magic methods with these dunder add and dunder i add, and, um, you know, those are different methods. I mean, they could be made to behave the same, but they don't start out the same. Um, but, but nonetheless, even though it's calling these different methods, you might have the intuition that it would be perverse for any third-party object, you know, any uh, object from a third-party library would actually treat them differently because that's weird. Um, and you just expect when you're learning, you know, the meaning of plus and the meaning of equal that they would amount to the same thing. So, you know, maybe that's an argument. Maybe this is just too perverse and we shouldn't worry about that case. But there, there is a library that you might have heard of that does this. In NumPy, we have exactly this difference in behavior. Um, I'm sure most of the people in the room have worked with NumPy, at least some, but the idea is that it's a uh, library for essentially uh, fast arrays with fixed types that you also operate on element-wise in the various operations. And so in this A1, I've given it a type of int, and the A2, I've given it a type of float. And so these are typed arrays that you can do these various fast things with. And where we use the inline plus, we uh, create a new array, and we coerce it to whatever the, you know, the, the proper, the, you know, sort of higher level numeric type is and floats more general than int in some sense. So A3 is going to wind up as a float, but if we do this inline add, we keep the type of the original array, so we coerce everything to ints instead. So this you know, extremely widely used, well-known library, in fact, gives different semantics, and if you were to try to apply some to objects of those with their different semantics, which are sequences, then it couldn't do what you want. Um, okay, so now we've got to the point where I think I've convinced you, I've convinced myself that using sum isn't a good way to spell concatenation. And in fact, I think we should have a new built-in called concat that sort of is as fast as it can be in a variety of cases dealing with sequences. Um, that, that was something that sort of came up on Python Ideas a month ago, and who knows, maybe that'll happen. Um, it could deal with strings too, which would be sort of nice. Um, but, okay, so sum isn't a good way to add sequences together, but at least it's a good way to add numbers together. Um, it's really not so much. It doesn't give you the right answers. So that's not an ideal behavior either. Um, and the reason it doesn't give you the right answer is because Floating point numbers are just weird, and no one understands them, and <laughs> no one can understand them. In particular, what we're getting is we're getting underflow errors, and um, I can kind of explain it in more detail, but the, the point is you don't necessarily get the right answers adding floating points. Um, now, you might think, well, floating points, they're weird, they're just gonna give you the wrong answers, but actually, you can do it right. And we actually have a function available to do it right in the math module in the standard library called fsum. And yeah, here's a little example, but um, you know, it adds floating points. And there's the little help screen for it where it adds floating points as well as can be done within you know, the rounding limits of floating points. But it doesn't produce these underflows because it does clever stuff about reordering the additions and um, Anyway, it does it, it does it well for floats. So we have this other function that's available that does floats right. So the question that we might think of is, well, this f sum is just better. Maybe we should just use that to add numbers and we shouldn't use sum. But the behavior of that also isn't right always. And I, I give here a few examples. Um, these are sort of wor worth looking at a little bit and understanding. I, in the first couple lines, I create uh, several decimal numbers. Um, 
and I do an F sum on those and I do a sum on those, well, if I do the F sum, what I get as an answer is a floating point number, which is numerically equal to the decimal number, but it's a different type. And if we've chosen to create numbers as decimal numbers and we're doing operations solely on decimal numbers, there's probably a reason why we want those to be decimal numbers. And, you know, automatically doing a type conversion in this case is kind of wrong, and some seems to do a better thing there. So there's a similar example here with fractions, which is another wonderful numeric type, which is also not floating point. And it, it's exactly the same story. If we do an F sum on um, these fractions, we get an answer which is not even numerically accurate. It's close-ish, it's not too far off, but it's a floating point number which is non-equal to the fraction that we get when we use sum on the actual fractions. We're sort of walking through a similar thing, but let's add some integers. Again, F sum gives us a floating point value, sum gives us an integer, and we probably chose integers because we want integers, so it's sort of rude of F sum to coerce for us. And then one more, complex numbers, sum does something nice, F sum just blows up, so we can't use it at all, and you, in an actual program, may you know, wind up getting this exception on a particular set of data that has mixed numeric types, where sum is never going to do that. Um, so, I mean, so the answer is complex. Should we use F sum? Yes, if you know you're dealing with floating point numbers, if you know that the answer you want is F sum. But sum is still more general. Uh, that's enough for that. So there was this idea that sort of came out of the previous idea that, okay, we're not gonna change the behavior of sum, but at least let's have a special kind of sum that behaves correctly on numbers and is also fast-ish. And in particular, uh, um, Stephen um, DiPrano wanted this to put in a statistics module, which is now part of Python 3.4, uh, and it's, you can see from, I, do I put the naming here? Yeah, I do, on this slide. Anyway, it's, it's um, underscore sum, so it's sort of the semi-hidden thing. It's not really sort of officially exposed as an API, but it's used for the various other statistics functions that are in that module. But, of course, it's not hard to get at either. So this is a nice type, and maybe this is the right way to deal with all of our different summing of numbers. Um, and as I say before, we're giving up, we're not using sum on sequences, but maybe it's okay for all the different types of numbers. Um, but it's not actually that good. I mean, it's good. We can see that if we want to, uh, if we're interested in performance again, and we want to use plain old sum on a bunch of fractions, which, uh, did I mention here? Yeah, so I, you can look at the source file, but I generate, using a fixed seed, uh, 10,000 fractions, so they're always the same fractions each time. Um, and I use sum to add them, and it takes rather a long time. I mean, you know, two and not quite a half seconds, where if we use this function that statistics underscore sum, which is just um, renamed stat sum in the import, uh, you know, we get down to 100, um, milliseconds, which is a heck of a lot better. But actually, I have a, another version of this code that is another five times or something better, which, so, so you know, the stat sum is generally fast-ish on numbers. It does preserve type. If there's mixed types, it does promote everything to floats, which is sort of the reasonable behavior. Um, but if everything you start with is a fraction, it stays a fraction, and if everything you start with is a decimal, it stays a decimal. And so it kind of behaves nicely the way you'd want. Um, and it's better, but it's not as fast as we should be. Um, well, I sort of pull this out just so you can see the timings a little bit more clearly. Um, I, I forget what the multiplier is, but okay, so what we get in stat sum is about 19 times, 20 times faster than the built-in sum, but actually I have this version which I'm about to show you which gets us another five times faster. 
So, you know, it gets to a total of 100 times faster than the built-in sun, even using pure Python code, and we're probably gonna get five times that fast if we write the thing in C. So, well, we'll go to the next slide, but. So this is basically the same function that, I mean, I wrote this, but essentially my idea made it into the statistics module with some more stuff to uh, check the types of the things in the sequence of numbers as you get them and decide whether you need to promote things to float or, uh, you know, so there's a little bit more logic in statistics than what I do, but here's sort of the heart of the algorithm is that the reason that adding fractions is slow is because doing greatest common denominator calculations is slow. And you do that a lot of times every time you add two fractions together. And if you have a large collection of fractions, probably a bunch of them have the same denominator. And so you might as well just add the numerators together as integers and then sort of at the end deal with this. And so this is the algorithm I do is I create bins for having the same denominator and I just add in all the numerators and then at the end I'm going to add that smaller number of fractions together. Well, the algorithm that's in statistics is essentially this, but rather than using this merge sum that I'm gonna show you in one moment, it just uses the built-in sum. Well, it uses the, anyway, it, I don't know what it does, <laughs> but it, it doesn't use this next clever thing I'm gonna show you, which gets us the extra five times speed. Um, but it does, you know, it is this 20 times faster, so that's nice. Oh, that's not my slide. Um, oh, that's terrible. Um, my slide has disappeared. Well, there it is. I, they, they, I don't know why they got reordered. Uh, that was supposed to be my clever final slide. Um, I'll, I think <laughs> after the next, I'll have to jump back. So, so anyway, so um, this is um, Oscar Peterson, I say somewhere who did that. Um, Oscar Benjamin, sorry. So there's this other thing you can do that the problem, um, so I've been doing this bin sum, I've you know combined um, the denominators together into a smaller number of fractions, but still it's more difficult to add two numbers with um, large denominators together, and we do that every time if we just do the addition and sequence, but instead we can do this by, you know, uh, splitting the tree of numbers in half repeatedly so they're ordered already by denominators, and then we just take the first and the last half, and we tend to add things with smaller denominators until the very last few operations, and so this gets us an additional five times speed up. So if you combine these two rather short functions, then you know you get something that's much faster. Um, so my idea is that actually we should have a in the fractions module a sum function for that. We should have in the decimal um, module a sum function that does using a similar sort of algorithm fast summing on decimals and any other numeric types should sort of come with their own sum, perhaps a few other basic operations, but at least that. Um, and then that's where I'm supposed to end. Um, but I, I, so, I mean, there, there's sort of the moral I was trying to get out of all of this is things that seem simple to do. I mean, this thing that I started with is, is seems like a very simple, very basic change, which has obvious benefits. Once you sort of go through these long discussion threads of them and pick apart all the rather subtle semantic nuances that are implied by these changes are almost always done right to start with in Python, and that's Guido's time machine. Um, so I guess that's it for me. I don't know where I am on time. But I'm hoping there's time for questions. Is there cool. Uh, thank you very much, David. Uh, who's got it? Yes, give him a round of applause. Um, okay, so we can have a couple of questions. I'm going to start back here. Uh, I've just got a quick question. Um, I'm assuming, I guess someone else probably also raised this on the ideas list about that changing the, the sum from add to iad. Uh -huh. 
wouldn't that also have a knock-on effect of your passing something into some where you're expecting it to, like say you pass in a list which has got stuff in it, and you're expecting to just get an output of a sum, but you're also going to end up modifying the list you passed in, which is a little bit of a, oh. I mean, I'm guessing, I'm, unless, my, unless my memory is faulty as to how that works, but since you're passing in, say, a list of numbers and you're doing I add, then at the, you're going to get an output, which is obviously a value, but that well, if it's a number, list it's you immutable. passed in, won't that get modified at all? No. Yeah, oh, that's true. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, if the only time it would get modified is if one of the lists that's in the list of lists being passed to sum is the same as the sum you're trying to create, which is going to get you an infinitely long list anyway. So that's going to be a problem in a different way. But as long as that, I mean, but none of the lists you're summing are the exact same object as the, the start, the initializer. So I, I don't think you'd see that problem. What was the question? Well, oh, oh, if you passed in as the initializer or something that was, uh, yeah, that's true. I mean, if you passed in some initializer that was an existing object that you wanted to stay the same, then that would change that behavior. Although, uh, well that, that will, I mean, that's not different though. That'll do it with the existing implementation of sum. If you take an existing mutable sequence, a list, and you pass it in as the initializer to the, the very poorly performing and don't use it, um, some function that we already have, it'll still mutate it. So you'll, you know, lose whatever value you had there before. So I don't think that is a change of semantics either way. Anyway. Dr. Mertz, um, Armin Ronacker, uh, the Austrian core dev, he wrote a, an essay a couple months ago, and these are my words, not his, but what I took from it was he was saying, look, we've got these different implementations of Python, C Python, Jython, uh, Iron Python, PyPy, Pi Pi et cetera. PyPy for him. PyPy for him, yeah. And his point, if I understood it correctly, is you know, this combination of C and Python in the code base has just gotten so complex and bastardized, and I'm, these are my words, not his, that every time you do something like this, uh, it, it completely jacks up the ecosystem and just makes it so hard for those other implementations to catch up with C Python. Is the idea among the C Python community that, hey, we're the originals, whatever we do, you know, we do what we want and you follow suit, or is there consideration for the, the bigger Python ecosystem? Uh, I think I'll just say that I'm not a Python core committer. <laughs> I don't know the answer. You know when I asked the guy the question yesterday, I said, look, please just give me a, uh, an antidote whether you want to or not about your um, election experience. <laughs> but actually, you know, I, I did read, this, is, this was a very good blog post that um, Armin Ronecker did uh, about a month ago, right? Um, and he was complaining about some changes to the implementation of CPython in Python 3 versus Python 2. And in particular, there's this use of um, a slot, which is not the same as the Python exposed slots, that's meant to be a speed up in accessing certain members of objects. And actually, it's not. It's just a performance drag, and it shouldn't have been implemented that way. And I think he did, I, I should look at it again, and I recommend people look this up. I don't remember the exact title, but I imagine you can find it, where I think there would be some subtle semantic changes if you were to fix this essentially performance issue in the implementation of CPython 3. Um, but I kind of think he's right enough that we should deal with those minor semantic changes and then, you know, 3.5 or something, just put in some warnings that in these weird edge cases that you probably don't use that actually some behavior will change. Um, but, but that question was really more about what, it's sort of an implementation of CPython issue. I mean, he's complaining about it partly because he sees that CPython is, CPython 3 is slower than it needs to be and in some respects slower than Python 2. I mean, at least in, in regard to, you know, certain corner of the behavior. 
but he's also complaining because he's one of the authors of Pi Pi, and it makes his job a lot harder to match that weird corner case semantics in a different implementation. But I'm not, I'm not sure if this is really insensitivity on the part of the CPython core developers. It's just the fact that old code bases you know, accumulate lots of weird corners that people don't really understand, and they don't tend to touch if they're not really obviously broken. Um, so is that closer to an answer? <laughs> OK. Hi. Uh, so do you have any advice for someone who has something that they see in Python and they think, wow, this is, this is bad. I'm going to take it to Python ideas. Do you have any advice for someone who's about to kind of undertake that journey for the first time? I, I think the most important thing, actually, and if you look at other than the ones that actually come from Guido, like this type annotations thing, which I think is, um, what is that, PEP 350, I believe, uh, that I think is going to be an interesting new thing. And um, Allison was asked a question about it yesterday. In Python 3.5, probably, maybe not till 3.6. But that was sort of, it was on Python ideas, but it was from Guido, so it's sort of <laughs> written there. But I, I think the problem with a lot of ideas that people post to, Python ideas is it's kind of looking at the language purely abstractly and saying, this would be cool if it did this. And there's no use case presented. And the ones that are discussed in much more detail and taken more seriously are, you know, I have this concrete problem in relation to my code. I'm writing this certain kind of code, and the way Python behaves now is an obstacle. I mean, maybe a performance one, but maybe just a, you know, it's more difficult to express something or whatever. But there's a, there's a concrete use case that makes Python at least purportedly broken, and then that provides rich material at least to discuss and more you know, motivation for why we'd want to change it. Not to say that it would necessarily be accepted even so, and it might be that, yes, that's true, but it makes these other things harder if you change it, or it becomes an attractive nuisance for these other difficult cases, or it's too hard to implement, or, you know, there's lots of things that come between here and there, but, but starting with a use case is definitely good advice. Cool. Any other questions? Got time for one more, if we have one. No, okay. Thank you very much, David.